Hello everyone, welcome to Prairie Whispers. We're happy to have you here with us today as we continue with our sixth session looking at hymnody today. Uh, and this is uh, one of the things that, again, we all do when we're the singing church. We've always been the singing church. Uh, but I think um, maybe perhaps more in recent years, I think you gentlemen would agree with me that uh, perhaps the clarity on what is a hymn and why do we sing it and how it plays in connection with our faith, the instruction of our faith, not only in worship but outside of worship, probably has gotten a little bit mixed in our, our postmodern American culture. Um, and uh, maybe it's, it's kind of a good thing to get back to some basics. Why do we have hymns? What does a hymn do? How does it play in our worship and in our, our spiritual life? Uh, but as always, before we get into our study today, I'm going to ask you, Pastor Bauer, to please uh, open with us with prayer. Holy Father, uh, you have given to us the amazing gift of being able uh, to speak to you in our prayers and to acclaim you and preach about you in our hymnody. Help us to do what you promise your hymns do for us, which is to say that they teach, they rebuke, they correct, uh, they teach. Uh, build us up by your Holy Spirit through the gospel given to us uh, as they are combined with the beauty of, of music in hymns. Uh, be with us uh, age after age. Help, it, help us to sing not just a, a new song, but to cherish old and favorite songs handed down to us through generations after generations. All this we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'd like to start off today with maybe a, a subject that's probably a little bit outside of our wheelhouse, but I think it will get us into our wheelhouse. It's, it's just a basic philosophical question of why people sing. Uh, one of uh, the most downloaded apps that we have in our, uh, our uh, smartphone culture is Spotify. Um, everybody has their playlists and everybody listens. So music, even in this day, is a very big part. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges perhaps we've had in uh, certainly since the age of the, the phonograph up to our present age is that, you know, it wasn't that long ago, if you wanted music, you had to make music. Um, and music was self-created and, and much of the music that we celebrated had a very local feel and local flavor. There were things passed on, of course, through hymn books and such like that. But, but I think to a certain extent, we've lost a little bit the idea of gathering together for singing um, and making our music, even though music is a central part. So um, there are a number of things I was just, I just kind of was, was doing a Google search. This is not scientific, but these are a couple of the things I just kind of gleaned from the internet um, that the secular world gives as reasons why we, why we sing. Um, uh, one was the Shakespearean theory. Music is, is one of the, is at least a food of love, is a strong um, uh, claim to be true. Um, the more uh, mellifluous the singer, the more dexterous the harpist, the more um, people he attracts. You know, so it's it's part of a, a mating ritual, if you will. I thought that was kind of an interesting one. Um, second idea is uh, that music binds people together. This, of course, I think we, we I, I guess, in in the secular world outside of the church, you do see this, especially in sporting events. Um, you know, uh, the seventh inning stretch or certain music that, that people play, um, everybody does react. Um, I think it's also true even in the military sense. I come from a military background um, where, you know, there are marches, there are cadences, there are things that, that bind people together um, that you do. And, and one of the third ones I... I or before Families, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah My yeah, wife yeah. and her sisters and dad have to do boot scoot yeah. and boogie at every family <laughs> there, wedding. Well, and, there, and there are. And there, there, are, there are those places in life that we do bind together. Stop. Music is added. And then there's this third hypothesis that music is a cross between an accident and an invention. This is kind of the evolutionary hypothesis that we, we kind of felt. The best picture of this for those affectionados of, of Mel Brooks movies is uh, um, where uh, somebody... You know, hit somebody on the on the the, the, the history of the world. Somebody hits one. somebody on the, on the leg. He makes a sound and keeps hitting. Ah, and then he gets a bunch of people. And he keeps hitting in very different ways to get different pitches out. But um, that that's kind of the the way. Uh, what I find funny about all of these a little bit is that there is a kind of a kernel of truth to them, but they they really lack you know digging. So. As always, since we're pastors, probably the best way to, to jump into it is like, what does the scripture give to us? How does the scripture describe music, its use? Where does it come from? And I guess the answer I come with is this. Music in general, and hymnody in, and specifically, is the spirit-wrought spiritual sacrifice that God's sentient creatures, we do talk about, we do apply this to nature, of course, but in, in an anthropomorphic way, but men, human beings sing, angels sing. They're both creations of God, and they are singing in response to God. You think the songs of the angels, 
uh, that songs of, of men that are recorded in the scripture to God. And it is, it seems to be our, the whole body, you know, we think about all that has life and breath, everything praising the Lord. So not only is it the, 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 the mental, but physically, you know, if you're singing properly, you get tired. Um, and, but we're offering, it's almost an entire expression of our mind, our body, our will in response to God, in gratitude to God for any, any number of his acts, his creation, his preservation, his conversion, his redemption, his sanctification. Um, um, I, I found this quote, and I think this is where we'll jump with our discussion. Um, Music is man's counterpoint to the sound of an acting God. It is sometimes broken and alone, sometimes low, sometimes high, sometimes far, sometimes near, but always deep, always profound, and essentially part of our Christian life. And I guess uh, since Pastor Brower, you've been here for a while, we're going to jump in with you. I'd like to get your feelings on uh, this, this discussion as we've had it so far, and maybe specifically this quote, what is music and its role, especially a, a congregational song? Um, in the life of the church? I can think of no better answer than, than Scripture itself. In, in Colossians 3, um, Paul writes these words. Uh, he says, um, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Um, such a beautiful description of what, of what um, in its proper use, our hymnody does. Uh, hymnody is, is um, it contains in it praise to God, but that's not its main function. Its main function is uh, to teach, uh, to rebuke, as it says here, uh, to teach, admonish, um, and uh, uh, with, all, uh, with our music combined with God's word. That's its main role. That's its main function. And, and let's talk a little bit more deeply in that. Let's go over to you, Pastor Schmidt. Um, one of the things that I think that Pastor Bauer touches on here is that the gospel in many ways is creates music um, it, it, it brings forth a song um, and I'm wondering if you can talk about maybe uh, places in the scripture where we see the gospel bringing forth a song the very the very pronouncement of the gospel cannot help but bring forth a song well either in angels or in men um, um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about how that kind of shows itself in Scripture. Yeah, I would say the one that pops into mind, right? Luke 2, right away, right? Here's the announcement of the Savior has been born to you, and we have the angelic choir singing there. Um, of course, the angels there in Isaiah, holy, 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 kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. You see, see how that is, those beings around God um, singing his praise. It, and it's not like how we think of it sometimes in school, like, oh, I gotta go to choir practice or something. It's, it's just the gospel inspires that natural reaction from the one that it is, is touching, whether it's the angels or, or mankind. Imagine the separation of music from the main points of the gospel, the birth of Christ, no singing on Christmas or Easter. Mm -hmm. Uh, or Pentecost. Imagine what a service would be like without that. There's just there's just this thing inside of us that God put into us that when we receive his grace by faith, that part of the reaction is, I want to sing about it. I want to give praise back to God. And, and maybe we, we have to expand this, not necessarily singing about praise, to uh, you know, that we praise God for his wonderful acts of mercy, but I think that, that we also tend to do that not merely in happy times, but some sad times. Right now I'm going to go to, over to you, Pastor, um, to dine. Um, there's a number of places in Scripture where we have rather odd places for hymns in uh, um, I, uh, my suggestion. Um, perhaps uh, um, Paul and Silas just get the living right. stuffing kicked out of them and flip by, and we find them singing hymns. Uh, we find, uh, it doesn't, I don't think it says they were specifically singing, but it does say they were praising God when Peter and John were counted worthy to suffer. Uh, they, they went home praising God. I, I, I have a hard time picture them not singing, or especially when they get back and not praising them. And then, you know, one of the other places I think we, in, in some ways, have to think about this too, is even when God finds man in his sin, um, I always picture this, that it's not simply a spoken announcement, but I almost picture it sung. 
um, in some ways. Maybe, maybe maybe it's not there, but there it seems to be there. There, there seems to be at the very least poetry right. in the promise of of uh, um, not only the the first gospel promise. Um, certainly, uh, there there are those things as well. So let let's talk about the aspect of. Um, Singing, especially because we sing at funerals, we sing at we we sing at at uh, when somebody you know loses a job or has a hard day. It, it's not simply kind of this. We also sing at very happy times too. But we also talk, let's talk about this where the song is something that is not merely for moments of success and glory, but but especially. And by the way, everything that Pastor Schmidt said is true, even in this setting. But let's talk about it in this setting too. Well, I mean, the first one that I went to, and you know, obviously to steal thunder from you, because that's what we do to each other, mm -hmm. is uh, the Magnificat mm -hmm. um, and Mary's response, or even Zechariah. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are one, yes, they're both in praise, and yet those are both moments of awe and almost wrestling with and trying to understand what exactly is unfolding before them and trying to really understand that. Um, the one for me that I always try to stress to the kids, especially in catechism, is Monday, Thursday night. Mm -hmm. You know, they had just had the Lord's Supper. Where are they going now to Gethsemane? What's going to happen there? And start to go through that. And what did they do just before they got there? And the kids always just kind of give you a blank stare, like, I don't know, what did they do? And you read it, and I forget which gospel it's in, so forgive me, but they went there singing hymns. Yep. And that's what they were doing Mark. as they were, it was Mark, okay. Yeah. As they're getting ready for this, they're singing hymns and getting ready for this moment. Um, it's just one of those things that really, it helps us understand that, yeah, it's not just the good times, but it's also, it can be these sad times. Um, I think of also Lazarus's funeral. I know they had professional mourners, um, but if I believe, if I remember right, part of that was like, they didn't just cry, but they were doing other things. And part of that was indeed singing and doing other things that went at that time while they mourned with the family. And so thinking about Lazarus's death before Jesus, arrives there and you have that group of people that are there with Mary and Martha and trying to trying to help in their own way but really you think they're there too with that group with like the nunc de menace mm -hmm. yeah. yes yep. Yep. let your servant depart in peace but by the way you will cause the yeah. falling and rising <laughs> of <laughs> many yeah. Yeah. you know it's both good and right. bad there. well but but again and let's happy and sad and, 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 and I think that there, there's something about that that I think that leads to uh, another aspect that I, I think we can we can talk about too but um, we'll get that late. we'll get that a little bit later when we get into it. But um, where when we talk about the gospel, we're not talking about some you know nebulous good feeling right. time. We're talking right. about the cross. We're talking about the redemption that comes from Christ Jesus. So it's 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 not this effervescent nebulous feeling it's a reality and we're proclaiming the work that god has done that leads me to maybe another point we should consider that um uh, and this goes back to the, the quotation you you talked from um, colossians here but um that the word there is something also about this that that touches all aspects of the soul the memory the will actions um, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, faith affects not only knowledge, it's not only assent, it's also confidence. It, it touches all those organs of the soul, if you will. Um, but there's something about singing in psalms, hymns, and spiritual, as you said before, teaching, that there's, there's something about this that in some ways is, it, it's almost like it's, it's kicked up a notch. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know how to describe it, and I think maybe that's something for us to discuss here, but... But it, it, in some ways, maybe it's it's bringing the gospel in a different way. That for some reason, and we don't exactly know, barely will know in heaven. But but for some reason, sticks. I don't know about you guys, but most of my prayers tend to be informed by the hymnody I've sung. Uh, when I'm in a hospital room with somebody, um, it, it isn't just the Lord's prayer or ex corde prayers that I make. But a lot of times, the comfort we'll have is singing a hymn. Um, one of the things that we visit shut as we've talked about this before, one of the things they miss most of coming to worship with the with the community is is uh, um, I'm seeing them. But uh, if you'd like to talk a little bit about that, Pastor uh, Pastor Bauer, where we, we talk about there's something about this that th there's a communal aspect to this that's that not only is this driving in, but it's pulling us together. And let's let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I I've 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 grown or or, or 
in, in my appreciation of that. I remember, um, you know, year after year, you, you walk through the part uh, um, where Jesus goes and he raises Jairus' daughter, right? And he gets in there, what's the first thing he does? Is he kicks out the dirge singers, mm -hmm. you know? And I always thought that was kind of funny. You know, you, uh, they had these professional um, uh, wailing women who would go in and then they would, in a certain sense, um, hoop up or, or, you know, get, get people sad and they would sing um, and they were evidently paid and they, uh, and the, you know, they knew what they were doing. First thing Jesus go does is, is he goes in and he kicks them out. And, and I think, think, thought to myself, you know, over the years, you know, maybe that, that, that that's, that's really good. But I've grown, I've changed. And, and what I mean by that is, is you draw on other parts of scripture, like for example, Joel, um, there's this huge calamity in, in, in um, Joel, locusts and armies and what have you. And what's the first thing that um, the Lord through Joel and encourages the people to do? To take up a liturgical dirge, to lament, to sing, to wail. Uh, and, and the priests then are going to be the ones um, uh, uh, leading that. I um, mean, that's a big deal because um, I've been a pastor for 20 years. Uh, two years ago, I had 18 funerals just within one year. Um, and one of the things that you see so very often is people, when, when it comes to a funeral, they're just in a daze. You know, their cherished loved one has passed away. And in a lot of ways, they don't have a clue what to think, what to feel, how to act, where to be. Um, and that's where, where the hymnody comes in because it, it preaches first to the body. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and, and, then it, and then it preaches to the soul. And that's a very important to consider because um, uh, uh, in a certain sense, if we're all clenched up as far as I'm all shut down as far as my feelings go, um, you know, by physically singing and also singing together with other people, ideally at the same time, you know, the same, uh, the same rhythm or whatever, and the same notes, um, when you're singing that together, that preaches to our bodies and then that finally then get, um, gets to our souls. And, and um, ever since I kind of discovered that, I've had a number of, of, of funerals and, and, and you see that, how people kind of internally, they, they either don't know what to do, they kind of stumble or mumble along, but then all of a sudden you have a liturgy you have hymns that you sing, and it gels it all together. What, what, an, what an amazing gift that is. I mean, I, 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 uh, and, and it's strange. I mean, you, you watch a movie, you watch a show, you know, you watch Lord of the Rings or whatever, and whenever there's a, a big moment to have, there's always music behind it. Mm -hmm. And there's this irony. Sometimes I think that um, the secular world gets this better than, than we do. Uh, they work hard on, on, on their music um, um, for these moments, so it's tied together, the brain is tied together with, with the body in a certain sense. Um, and, and then we get to churches and we're like, all right, let's get rid of all the music. I shouldn't say that. We don't get rid of it. We do just the opposite. We bring in the music for that reason. But when it comes to grieving, there is a healthy place for gathering together. There is a healthy place uh, that, that um, there would be healing for the body first before the healing begins to reach the soul. And, and I think you, you're, we're touching on something here is that um, we preach to a soul, but we have to be careful of that language. I don't know if people understand that as well as maybe previous generations did. By a soul, we don't mean that there's this disembodied spirit that we're preaching into in, and the rest is just meat. Unfortunately, we live in a world that has kind of a Gnostic attitude. What I do with my body doesn't matter, but you know, as long as my soul, that's a very, very, very dangerous idea that unfortunately is uh, found new hope. You know, I, I, you know, I can pierce and I can tattoo and I can do whatever I want with my body, and and uh, that doesn't affect what. Actually, what you do with your body greatly affects what you do with your soul. As it turns out, you know, um, you know, th this was a study they did uh, with uh, the use of Tinder, as as it does, um, that greatly affects people's psychological well-being. The more they use it, it, it greatly affects. So. This whole thing is that, you know, I can do whatever on my body if it doesn't affect my soul. It really does. Drinking, drugs, all these things. If you, if you live a life that abuses your body, it, you cannot help abuse your soul. But the flip side of that is when we preach the gospel, we talked about this last week, we're not just preaching to the ear. Last week we really talked about preaching to the eye um, with the stained glass, with the, with the pulpit, with the lectern, with the vestments that there is, we, we are really tr doing our best as humanly possible in the sinful world to surround the person, the whole soul, if you will, um, the, the body and the spirit uh, together um, with the gospel because uh, a person's mind may be so filled with all kinds of worries and cares, he cannot listen to the logical 
presentation of the gospel in the sermon, but he sings it in the, right. in the hymn, or, or uh, he sees it in the stained glass, um, or he notices it in, in uh, the, the liturgy that's being sung that day. But I think there's, there's something. One, and one, and yeah, go, and uh, years later, yeah. right, the body's still affected by yeah. some of that. I, I personally counsel people at the table mm -hmm. when we're planning if this is your favorite hymn, that's wonderful, especially when it is a appropriate mm -hmm. one. But will you be able to? Uh, I went this with my mother. She did. If you're listening, Nancy, this is <laughs> you're my example all the time. My grandmother died during Christmas. She wanted her favorite Christmas hymn sung at the funeral. I said, as a pastor, I would not suggest to do it because will you be able to disconnect the two in the future? Right. Yeah. And she yep. can never get over it. Yeah. Um, when they sing it, or a lot of people will choose. I know that my redeemer lives for a loved one, and you know, which is wonderful, excellent, awesome, right? But you know who's done this as the preachers. You look out during that hymn, right. and you see those people have wet eyes. Those people, years and years later, the body still reacts to that because it's just right. been the body and the soul have connected to to that. And I think thing. this this touches on that 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 we're we're driving the gospel far deeper than the hour. I think, I think the one thing that hymnody does is, um, I may forget the particulars of any given sermon. I think that the message gets through and I think, but I, I may forget the particulars of any given sermon I've heard. I can still remember maybe a theme, I can still remember certain parts of sermons years later. But the funny thing is, is that the, I cannot drive out all the verses of a mighty fortress or Lord keep us steadfast in that word. And I know that even when, if, if I am, if the Lord in his wisdom gives me dementia or gives me Alzheimer's, and you all experience this, mm -hmm. that is so deeply driven in, you just have to start playing the music and then they just start singing. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that I, I think it's, it's not only an aid, and maybe some of you do this, but I usually, when I'm writing, I'll usually have music on for some reason that, you know, that, that primes the pump. Um, but there are things that... Handel's yeah. Messiah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it depends on where you're going. Yeah, they're in sermon. Um, but the last thing, and again, I don't want to be too law motivated before we move on here, but I, I, I do think this is a, you got to be careful I say this, but God does also command that we sing. He does say in Psalm 96, for instance, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. And I, I think there is something pleasing. You know, I, I always, I'm always moved by that picture in the Old Testament that the Lord smelled the offering that was being offered. Now, again, that's an anthropomorphism. He's not actually smelling it. It's like, oh, that's that's some good prime rib you're putting on the. I mean, that's that's not. I'm sure it did smell really good, but that's not obviously. It, you know, he is pleased with the sacrifice of praise that is offered in faith. And I, I think the Lord here also is saying, I am pleased when my gospel is responded to in faith. Um, he's pleased when we do the good works that we respond to in faith, and I think he's also pleased when. When we sing, um, I don't know if anybody has any comments on that, but I mean, I I really think this is one of one of the things I keep saying is like we don't need we don't need to sing or worship can be simply you know putting this five minute devotion on. It's like I, mm, I I think those have uses, but I think it's a much bigger thing to take music out of the the, the service is just a a big thing because it it the Lord does want to hear and almost every place in the Old Testament, certainly every place in the New, music jumps up fast. I mean, there are so many songs. The entire book of Psalms, for instance, is, is that. Um, but I, again, I, I think there is something that the Lord also is commanding that we bring forth uh, a song of praise. That, uh, that it's not just engaging you know, our mind, but really our whole body um, um, to, uh, to respond to his grace. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I think part of the difficulty is, and I mean, this has been recently for me, um, a couple of people have kind of pushed back, not necessarily on hymns, but on some of the liturgy. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a new hymnal, and we're still, a couple years later, still getting adjusted to it. I understand that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the bigger issue is, is that as we listen to Spotify, as we have our radio on, as we listen to our favorite choir, as we listen to fill in the blank, mm -hmm. then when you come to church and it doesn't sound like that, you're like, oh, well, I don't sing as well as those people do, so maybe I'll just not do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I know I feel, I apologize. Throughout my ministry, I've had more and more people 
express that sentiment that you know because we don't sound like they do on their favorite radio station or their favorite Christian singer this that or the other thing it's not that we shouldn't sing but maybe we should consider someone leading in worship who does sing better or whatever it may be and it's interesting how many people like that becomes their mo at that point in time like that's how we should do things because you know the radio the people on the radio sound so much better than our local congregation does and it's it's not it can be tricky to convince them that even if you sound like a dying whale god wants you to sing to him right god wants to hear your voice you know, first, let's not get started about why those people on the radio sound so good and everything they go through to get there. Auto tune, that and more. <laughs> but it's just one where God wants to hear you. And I feel it's it's kind of like when people are afraid to pray. Well, I don't want to pray because I don't think I'll say the right thing, or I'll mess it up, or I'll do. And I feel it seems that people also don't want to sing because they don't want to sound bad because they don't want to do it wrong and i don't it's hard to express to people you can't do it wrong or but here, here's something also expressed to people um and this was stated by you know no less than the cantor of the cambridge college choir he said but what's more pleasing the ears of god you know um the uh seven lessons and carols or nine lessons and carols at uh Cambridge College, um, or the the Sunday school who's squeaking by, because I can guarantee you, you can drive a bulldozer through King's College on Christmas Eve and probably not hit a Christian, right. even though it's the the most beautiful mm -hmm. uh, aesthetic music you're probably going to hear among choirs, or those little five kids who are standing to stand up here and sing with all their might, joy to the world. Right. Right. Um, and so we have to be a little bit careful that as the aesthetics of music right. is not the most important thing. But I think you, you, you bring a good transition. And let's talk about some of the... Could I, could I, yeah, okay, sure, just to that point sure, before yeah. I move on. I, it's a, your observation is, is really neat. Just, and I'll make just a couple comments and then you can move on. But like the um, first of all, there's this huge gulf. You listen to something on the radio and it's not just good. It's like really, 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 really good. Um, you know, uh, uh, years ago when I was in, uh, uh, near Pittsburgh, uh, we, I saw um, Styx play. Mm -hmm. you know the old 80s band or whatever and I was amazed at the variety of genres and then I went and I googled it afterward um, those whatever five or six guys or four or five whatever mm -hmm. guys they wrote it they produced it they choreographed it they did all of it and then you you swip that, swatch, uh, switch, switch it out like with Beyonce or something she sings and then there's 85 other people that do all the other stuff sure. so I mean yeah. so the, um, the point I'm making is the professional professionality is, is up here and then, then the poor person who wants to sing uh, begins to think, oh, I can't do it unless all of a sudden I'm right. up here. And you go back 100 years ago, um, you go back 100 years ago, th there, there wasn't Spotify, but there wasn't TV or anything else either. So what do they do for fun? I mean, families would, would, would get so together and they'd right. actually sing. So the overall quality was a little bit better, you know, 100 years ago. But going back even farther, um, I just got done with... Um, uh, some con continuing education. I thought it was interesting. The uh, um, in Zephaniah, uh, um, next to the word for singing in, in parallel is is the word for um, rejoicing. And then you, you kind of look under the hood. What does the word actually mean? And the word is yalal. So and it's onomatopoetic. So it sounds like what it is. And so um, what when they were singing, what did it sound like? you know, like yodeling or something. Don't, don't think when you go back a thousand years, it was like, you know, chords and harmony and stuff. It was a whole lot more rough around the edges than what we might have um, today. And that's also so, so important um, to recognize because it, it's more approachable it, that it, way. It's interesting, however, I was listening to uh, NPR, this is about 15 years ago, um, but they were talking about some of the most prized recordings that you can get are recordings that professionals made in the privacy of their own home in front of yeah. friends that somebody recorded and they're full of mistakes yep. but they like because but just because of what you know so you know yeah. it means so is it is it really you know that you know it, that that the auto-tune and stuff is, and, and there comes a point too um like it's kind of i i like country music 
Um, and MC Hammer. No, no, just don't. Just, just listen. Don't, don't. I like country music, but the country music I pray, like pray. tends to be not anything that's coming out of Nashville. Um, because that's been all auto tuned and it's all been, you know. Right, right. But, but it, it tends to be, you know, like one of my favorite country music singers is out of Saskatchewan. And, you know, um, but, you know, it's a, it's a guy with a guitar and that's it. And, but he's singing, you can relate to the songs. Right. And, and it's not, and because it's not polished, it's, I really, you know, I really like it. And you can kind of feel, and, and so there, there is something about that. The other thing, and too, I, I think I made this, we made this comment before. I think we talked about last time with, with banners and, and things like that. There is something that is beautiful about local flavor. Right. And there's something yep, beautiful yep. about, about what, how this congregation sings. And I've had the, all oh, you guys will all have it, I suppose. But um, you, when you go around, each congregation sings hymns just a little bit differently. Yep. When we, and, mm -hmm. and it's neat. And, and, and it's not something that we say, oh, you don't do it. That's good that you don't do it. You know, that, that we sing and we sound and, and, and we do a little different. And that's one of the things that is very beautiful. Let's, let's move on a little bit um, into um, kind of our part two here. And um, I, I think one of the things also that we, we have to address here is uh, maybe some of the, the, the what, what do we exactly mean by him to deal? I think we get, let's clarify that a little bit more. And, and maybe some of the dangers when we look at what, are, what do we consider a good hymn and something that, that is good. Now, as we, as we said with our definition, or at least the definition I think we're working with, that this is something that is coming out of our Christian faith. It's a response to the gospel. Um, there is a poetry aspect to it, an individual's playing poetry. There is a musical aspect to it, but it's also meant for a community. It's meant for us, for us to sing. Now, um, in the Bible, we have the Psalms, which are called the hymn book of the Old Testament. However, the one, the one thing I do, just to clarify, I, I think the Psalms occupy a little bit different space because they are the inspired word of God, as opposed to the hymns. In a hymnal, are, they reflect the inspired word of God. They are not... Right. inspired right. word of God. And I, and I think we have to be a little bit careful of saying, well, psalms and hymns are interchangeable. And not really. Psalms are, they are God's songbook, if you will. They are the Holy Spirit songbook. And I think that if we, anybody who's worth their weight in salt, if they're going to write a Christian hymn, probably has to spend a lot of times in the psalms. Because um, that, that you get the whole range of emotions and all that, but that's that's the divine word. Spiritual songs, I think we would, we would talk about things like the Gloria, the Sanctus, um, and then the Nunc Dimittis, those are all also songs, but they are songs produced by the Holy Spirit. There are other great ones, uh, for instance, we, I think another name for spiritual songs would be a canticle in the Old Testament uh, or in the New. Um, but things like um, the song of uh, Moses and uh, Miriam, um, the, you know, that, that would be another uh, song as well. Um, but I think we have, to be, we, we have to say that these are also Spirit-inspired. And so I, I, I think that these are actual words of scripture. These are songs that Christians will sing forever and reflect and meditate on forever, and they are the word of God. And I think that's something that we care. And I, I like, we've already talked about this, the psalm is part of our liturgy. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, the spiritual song, especially the propers, are, um, the organs, excuse me, are part of our liturgy. But when we talk about hymns, and again, this is my definition, it's a creative, individual, musical expression of faith that responds and preaches forth the word of God and it shares it with the community upon which it has already been gathered by God. So again, it's a response to the means of grace by an individual, but it's meant to be shared with the other individuals who are responding to those same means of grace. And so I, I think we have to make it very clear that a hymn is going to be different from a psalm and from a spiritual song in that way, but it's also radically different than the secular song outside. <clears throat> sure. And and we're not, I just want to make clear, we're not talking at all about what instruments we use or the voicing or what parts are singing or anything, anything like that. We're not talking at all about form at this point, but there is a radical difference between the purpose of a hymn versus the purpose of a secular song. We're not saying secular music is bad. There's nothing wrong about singing about a flower or a sunny day or, you know, there's, there, there's plenty of examples of where we can do that. But there is something specifically different about a hymn. A hymn is meant to comfort, meant to praise, but it, is, it comes out of the preaching of the gospel. It is a response to the Spirit's work on our heart through the means of grace. And it is a reflection of that uh, work. Again, I like that quote we had said earlier. It's, it's man's counterpoint to God's. You know, symphony, if, if you will. 
Um, that leads us to maybe some warnings, and I think this is where I kind of want to steer our discussion here. And we'll talk about each one of you can maybe jump on the word. We'll start with you, Pastor Schmidt. I think one of the warnings you have to be a little bit careful when you look at what makes a good hymn or what hymns we want to use is the, the quality of emotion. I'd like you to talk a little bit about where are emotions good in a hymn and where do we perhaps have to be careful that we not let the emotions run wild uh, in, in the hymn. So the, this idea of the emotionalism or romanticism where we are so taken back by the, the feeling that we have that we, we maybe are moving a little bit further too far away from the spirit. Yeah, I would say a big problem in this area is when the, the music trumps what's being, su- the words, the, the, what's be the message being sung and taught there. Uh, yes, hymns in a perfect world should be singable and enjoyable to sing so that you don't have the pastor like where I was at on Sunday. After the first verse, he went and got a pencil and said, only consider this hymn in Lent, exclamation point, in my hymnal, because it wasn't singable. The message was great, but if I now just take this emotion, well, I didn't feel anything from it. Well, again, your faith isn't based on emotions. It's based on that message being sent by God and sung in the hymn. Right. And so that's, the, that's where we can go to an extreme. Well, pastor, these aren't all singable, or they're just not fun enough to sing. Well, there's some truth to that at times, but look at the message that's being sung. And when you put as much emphasis, which is hard, I think, for American culture, right? If you put as much emphasis on the words or more, right, there are some that, okay, this isn't the, my favorite tune, but it's much more palatable because the message is, is so powerful and strong. And, and that stirs up an emotion in us. Again, obviously working in the Holy Spirit through God's word being sung. And, and that's one of the things where I think there's a danger is people just the first time they hear a hymn, it's no good. It didn't make me want to jump up and dance and, you know, cheer at a football game. Well, that, that's not the point of it. Look at the message that's being yeah. brought the, to So, the again, we... we I think that the emotion, the emotion should come from the preaching in the hymn, not from necessarily the aesthetic of the hymn. Right. Uh, for some of, some of the best hymns in the world, again, uh, there is something to that. We, we pick hymns that, just like we pick readings, we pick hymns that match certain things. Um, you know, for instance, things in a minor key tend to be, in Lent, tend to be something that tends to Put us in, and things in a major key tend to be, you know, something that that's more of a praise versus more of something that's introspection. Um, that being said, though, the the purpose of the music is to underscore and elevate the text, because the text is what's going to be the punch, not the music. And again, we have to be careful not to let the music or let our emotions of the music. The other thing too, and this, I I think we're finally getting away from this. I hope anyway we're getting away from this, but. Um, the idea that uh, we can take a secular tune and just throw some cheap Christian lyrics on it and it's going to be popular, and it, it, that, does a, that does a number. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think of some of the, some of the and these are camp songs. I don't think we ever sang them in church, but even if for camp songs, you have the danger even with camp songs of, of maybe, you know, even, even a good camp song, I think, should be ultimately something that should, should be driving home a spiritual truth. Um, and not just, oh, it's fun to sing. Um, you know, that, that there is, I want you to walk away with that, that message. Yeah. A great example is, uh, to me, it's singing, again, is it fun to sing, oh, dearest Jesus? No, I don't necessarily find that tune fun in rah, rah, rah. But to me, that's one of the most powerful hymns when it's sung within the context of, of Good Friday. It sets... You know, it was Good Friday for us, but it wasn't for Jesus. Look what's going on. You just see the power there. And that's where I think that's a good example of where the words pull out an emotion where uh, on the surface you're like, well, this, this doesn't get my blood going, and yeah, I'm excited to be here. I, I think, you know what I'm I, saying? I think emotion in the church, maybe you guys agree with that. Emotion in the church is like humor in the pulpit. Humor should never be forced. The pulpit is not a place to do stand-up. Now, there may be a place where humor is natural text. For instance, I cannot help but laugh every time that text comes up where uh, Jesus warns the 
his disciples about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Is he mad we forgot the bread? It's like, you know, you just, you have to laugh a little bit at the, at, at the, the, the density of the disciples at that point. You just, you just picture Jesus just slapping himself. Okay, guys, let's go through this again. What we mean by yeast. Um, and, you know, a humor can come out of that very naturally, but it's not something that's forced. We should never write a hymn with the intention of trying to create an emotional response. If there is an emotion, it should be from the author who is himself captivated by this doctrine, by this teaching. And it, in fact, that's the thing driving him to write the hymn. Um, I, I think of one of my favorite hymns uh, for Christmas. Um, um, Lord Jesus Christ, thy manger is a paradise in which my soul reclineth. You know, you just think of that, that, that picture of that, you know, you're, it's such a wonderful place. You want to cuddle up in the hay next to Jesus. Um, you know, where, where that's coming out, something like that. Um, but let's move on to a, a different point. It's related to this, but Pastor Bauer, we're going to to you, is the, the danger of egocentrism in hymn writing, or, or another way of putting anthropocentric hymns, where they're about my feelings about God, or me in the center, and God's kind of the satellite out in the periphery. Um, I think one of the big ones, is it's kind of lost itself a little bit, but, you know, um, uh, uh, Peace Like a River, I think, was a big a big one, or, or Shine Jesus Shine was a big one uh, when I was a kid. There are others that have that come up, but um, it, it tends to be more about my feelings about Jesus rather than, um, or how this affects me, rather than actually proclaiming what Christ has done or what God has done or what the Word proclaims. What are some of the dangers of anthropocentrism or egocentrism in writing? I, I had a professor once who, who said, you know, be very careful of, of the first person pronoun, you know, I, 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 when you're, when you're singing hymns. And I think generally, I, th I think that's true. Uh, there would be one, you know, an exception is, is to say, I've kind of thought about this over the years, is does the hymn that says I or me, does it draw you back to God's word and the sure foundation or farther away? Um, the, the uh, 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 so to give you a good, uh, hopefully a good example of this is, um, Oh, the uh, uh, Abraham's bosom one. Um, Lord, no, 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 come on. Um, Abram's bosom, Rock carry my me. Soul in the bosom of Abraham. No, 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 <laughs> come on. I was just, it was just on the tip of my brain there for a second. Uh, 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 dun, 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 dun. Oh, Lord, let us thine angels come. Yeah. Abram's bosom, bear me home. Bear me home. Yeah. Um, you, you can look at that hymn. And, 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 and there's I, I, I everywhere, my, my, my. But what is the I doing? It's drawing me back to Jesus. Um, there is a different sort of I, as it were, um, the sort of I that takes me into either vagueness or away from Jesus. Um, you know, there was a, a, a Christian pastor who put it this way. He said, of the, the top-selling songs on the Christian contemporary um, CCLI list, 20 years ago, you had to be careful because they um, uh, openly preached false teaching. He said, 10 years ago, um, and moving into now, you have to be careful because they really don't say, um, I'd lead you to much of anything. I mean, you could be a Unitarian and pretty much agree with it. And it, it's all I, and then God, and then there's feeling, and then you have no, no, no real idea of really what's going on, and you're being drowned or lit on fire or absorbed by, by, um, by the Holy Spirit. Um, that's kind of what's going on there. But as far as what did Jesus do for me, you, you would never know that by actually hearing the hymn. And that's the difficulty with the I. Um, um, uh, the uh, 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 is the, uh, uh, at the end of the day, you want um, what's going to give you solace and comfort and hope is not how I feel about Jesus primarily, but instead, um, what, did, what does Jesus feel about me and what did he do for me? Um, and so there is a place for I in me, um, but the foundation needs to be what did Jesus do for me. Right. Qu question for the two of you sure. guys. Having went to the little, little seminary out on the prairie with Reverend Doctor here versus the, the big seminary on the golf course that you guys went to in Mequon. <laughs> golf course. Um, it looks like a golf course. Um, I prefer nature preserve, but that's okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the professor. I, I, yeah, I prefer a, a, a geese um, a sanctuary. Yeah, geese, geese, geese sanctuary. <laughs> sanctuary. <laughs> so the, the professor that, that we had at our seminar that took us through hymnody, he, he made a good point. It's not possible every Sunday, but kind of along these lines is he always encouraged when planning worship, because you do the worship plan for every week assignment, to intentionally, whenever possible, 
have that him be we's and us to take us out of the it's about me and I American culture and we are coming now together as one body in Christ to have God speak to us and to, to return thanks. And, and did you, I'm assuming maybe uh, something was... I, I, I think there's something I think, important I think there, one, too. The, well, the, yeah. the, one, the one thing I think that we, we did um, is... And again, this is where I think a good worship committee that puts together a good hymnal saves you a lot of time. I hope and trust that they've done a lot of that work so that I, you know, there is a predominance of that. I think for me, the thing that that we have to walk watch out for is again not be too dogmatic about it because I, I think most people would agree that Paul Gerhardt is probably the greatest Lutheran hymn writer just by the sheer volume of hymns he wrote and also by the state. I mean, his hymns are beloved in, in almost every hymn that we can get, but he uses the word I all the time. Um, a couple other ones, Hans Brorsen, who's, who's a Danish hymnist, Thomas Kingo, who's another Danish hymnist. Um, those are the three great hymn writers of the, of the Lutheran Church, and they, they use I all the time. I'm glad you left Luther uh, off. Um, but uh, um, Lu- Luther, 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 funny, Luther, funny enough, did not use us a lot more. He, he tended to use us a lot more. Um, and uh, I, I think... Part we, we have to be careful because remember hymns reflect the age they were written in. Mm-hmm. They reflect the things that. Would, but I, I think the thing that I'm concerned with more over than anything else is not not the I itself, but how is the I right. being used? Right. And I, that's the point that I think we always struggle with a little bit planning worship. And that and one of the questions we have is well, where did this hymn come from? And it, it kind of know the genes of the hymn um, and the genes of the hymn writer help a little bit. Not that they take it out, but I think that helps a little bit. Far more, I think, dangerous than the actual, that is the style of worship um, that, that is being done. Um, I, I, you've mentioned this before. When we have uh, a group that, when everybody feels, I can't sing, so we're going to have these five people sing, and, and where are they getting all their music, and who's actually lifting the name of God on high? Is it all of us, or is it just you? That becomes really dangerous, and I think that's something we have to be a little bit careful with. But one of the things, again, we, we've made it very clear throughout this service that we're not, this Bible study, we're not making any laws where God has made none. However, uh, going back to that good practical pastoral route, everything that is permissible is not beneficial. And I always get a little worried when people adopt a style of worship that gets a little bit more like a concert of entertainment, me sure. as a receiver, and me as a performer, rather than we are collectively coming together around the means of grace. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to answer that and answer yeah. that too. that um, too. How, how is the I and me used, you know, and, and you brought that up, Pastor yeah. Meitner. I think I, I'm okay with I and me um, uh, in, in hymns um, because there's a difference between I and me listening to Spotify while I'm walking through the prairie. Mm-hmm. When I'm saying I'm singing I and me sandwiched together with my family in the pews with 100 other people or 50 other people, all of a sudden the I takes on a weak quality just by the fact that you're here with other people. You know, so there's, so there's a lot to that. But also then, you know, um, uh, Pastor Meitner, what you mentioned is, is so true. The, you know, Professor Tiefel used to talk about one of the five principles or six, I forget how many number, the five or six principles of, of, of uh, Christian worship, forgive me, Professor Tiefel, uh, is it, one of them is let the people participate. And, and um, Lutherans can be just as guilty uh, um, if they're high church as if they're low church. Um, or to put it differently, the, the praise band um, up there on, on the stage with a fog machine and, and the spotlight can be just as distracting uh, if it becomes a spectator sport as the organ. Um, you know, and, and, and I, it's been nice yeah. to see, it's been nice to see us move away from what was in, and I'm gonna be a little bit, a, a tiny bit critical for just a moment, um, in the Red Hymnal. In, in our Red Hymnal, there were some, um, I'm, I'm a singer. I mean, I took voice lessons, I was in choir for a long si- uh, time, and one of the things that just annoyed me, even when I was, uh, uh, you know, in high school, was how unsingable some of the, these parts were. And you could tell they just took the organ score and dumped it into the hymnal. <laughs> I mean, if you were a bass trying to sing that poor thing, look at Joy to the World um, um, in the red hymnal. Instead of having it stacked up, we're taking turns. And it's so awkward. It's just 
so awkward that I want to go back to TLH for that. I have no idea what they did in the new hymnal with that. But my point is, is that it becomes a showcase, look how pretty our organ is. And then the person is just um, stuck there in the pew going, yeah, but w w when's my turn? Um, so that there can be a, a danger on, on, on both sides of it, but it boils down to, you know, let the people participate. And there's more I could say about the practicality. And, and again, I, I think you can let people participate and let other people who have special gifts also um, grow up. But I think we, we want to move on a little bit here. Um, and I'm going to just pivot with a quotation here. Uh, Walter Bozin, uh, who a couple generations ago was a leader on um, many, many music scores uh, in, in the Lutheran Church. I think he was actually the director of the Bethany College Choir at one point in his career. Um, but he wrote this, if Christian theology is regarded by Christian theologians as a theology of the cross, then church musicians ought to regard church music not only as an art, but more specifically as music of the cross. In view of the fact that Lutheran theologians rightly refer to the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ crucified as the cardinal doctrine of the Christian religion, the musician as well as the theologian and laity of the church may well refer to text accompanying or text suggesting music which presents and interprets the doctrine as much as the cardinal music of the church. And I think there's a very powerful point he's making there is that what really is priming the pump of any hymn, whether we're using I or me or us, it's the text, it's mm -hmm. the cross, it's mm -hmm. the theology of the church. And so uh, one thing, again, a little outside of our wheelhouse, but, you know, Lutherans should write Lutheran hymns. And, and we should not get ourselves into the rut of professionalism, like, well, only somebody who's this high up can write it. That's right. bunk. Right. Some of the best Lutheran hymns are written by people perhaps who didn't have any. Um, and it, what's really funny, when you look at the hymns and the writers in the hymnals, very rarely is the poetry of one person also matched with the music of one person, almost, it's a rarity. Mostly, this hymn existed for many years until somebody finally put a, the Lord brought musical gifts that weren't around at the time and right. slapped it on there, and then, then the hymn, you know, the, 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 the text took off. But I think we have to recognize that, that um, this whole idea, of, I, I really eschew this thing, that hymn writing is for the professionals. No. Um, or organ playing is for the professionals. No. Um, I, I think that all of our music making and all of our liturgy and all that we've been talking about is the response, first of all, of God in his people preaching and teaching, and we in response to that going forth. And these are the tools, whether it's art, visual, our, our body singing, that's, that's something. Now, I want to pivot with that thought into um, uh, how, do we, how are we going to use hymns? I'd like to kind of close our, our study a little bit, the last 10 minutes. Um, on, on how are we going to pick hymns? We could talk forever about our favorite hymns, and I'm going to let you guys kind of work your favorite hymns in here, but how do we use hymns? I'm going to go to you, Pastor Dane, with, with the first one. How do we, first of all, have this massive treasure we call hymnody, and, and at the same, keep it fresh, but at the same time, don't fall into ruts. And again, we, we have a pericope to keep us from doing that right, when it comes right, to right. preaching. How do we do it when it comes to worship planning? So for me, well, first, if you use the worship planner, it tells you the last time that you used a particular yeah. hymn. But, um, but before that, what I actually did, I just kept the spreadsheet going to figure out what hymn I was using on, or at least one of the last times I had used a particular hymn. Because um, I, I like how some churches have approached some of it some of the hymns that we're going to focus on a core 150 hymns and we'll add a couple every now and then but we're going to focus on this core because what we really want people to know um and so i mean the hard part is for me coming out of the els i'm still kind of beholden to the elh as you're learning and slash no mm -hmm. And all right, Trinity 21, these are the four songs you sing, and then you're done. You're like, right, cool. It's not that I didn't have to think about it, but great, you tell me, like what normally goes with the gospel, and this is right up my alley. Um, so I like that, but at the same time, I am one where if there's a particular hymn that I think works, and it's usually for Advent and Lent, I am not above using the same opening hymn or same closing hymn, you know, to tie all the midweek services together. Um, so, you know, I'm supposed to work in my favorite ones. Um, we've done it a couple of years now where Jesus I Will Ponder Now is the opening hymn during Lent just to help people get ready 
and, and, and be in that moment, I think really helps, or stricken, smitten, and afflicted. I think it really just helps people understand what is going on. Um, because there are certain hymns that you could use year after year after year, but then you are depriving the people of a great, rich treasury of other hymns that are out there. And so I'm kind of speaking out of both sides of my mouth because I love using hymns to make them stick in people's mind. But at the same time, I also love introducing new hymns because we have such a treasury out there of just the hymns that we can choose from. But keeping track of them and making sure that you are, you're not hobby horsing hymns, I think is an important thing to do when it comes to planning the hymns that you're using. And then just seeing how they line up with the particular um, text that you are preaching on on that given Sunday or for whatever is coming up, I think is just one way to do it. Uh, Pastor Brower, another aspect of this, um, how do we encourage um, new hymns? Um, how do we encourage uh, that we keep a lot? I think, the, first of all, I don't think we have to work too hard because I think the Spirit does bring them forth. The Spirit does inspire hymn writers of every generation. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I also think there's something to her. This thing, I guess, I've fought all my ministry um, is this idea that that hymns now are the, the, these are for the professional people. These are the, you know, and I was like, well, fooey on that. Um, how do we, how do we uh, balance uh, um, keeping a standard? I mean, we don't want somebody to write, you know, la, 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 Jesus, 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 and then that's the hymn that we want to, you know, challenge that versus giving somebody an opportunity to, to uh, uh, really express and use these gifts. Yeah. That's going to be number one on Spotify. Oh, right. <laughs> la, la, la. We're making yeah. it happen. Yeah, yeah, bring it on. The, okay, the, you had mentioned before, um, how do we get good hymn writers? I'm going to rephrase it, basically. Okay. How do we get good, um, good hymn writers? Uh, I'm going to start where you, where you left off a couple, um, um, a couple uh, minutes ago. Psalms. Okay, that's our hymn book from the Old Testament, and I appreciate what you said. How that's we can honestly, um, clearly say, hey, that's the inspired one. What we have in our in our hymnal is reflected in our hymns. Um, you know, Keith Getty, the the famous um, Baptist hymn writer, and there's a number of hymns, his hymns in our hymnal. Um, I heard an interview um, w um, with him where he said, in his own church body, within one generation, all the psalms vanished. Nobody sings the hymns anymore. Um, and in our new hymnal, um, I admit that uh, the, the Psalter, the collection of psalms that we have, is beautiful. I, I, um, we do a, a new um, uh, uh, psalm of the month. Uh, every month we bring out a new, a new psalm. And I have yet to find one that's like, okay, we'll just kind of bury this one and never use it again. They're, they're beautiful. Um, the, the men who worked on, 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 that, on that committee did some really, really good work. Um, but then how do, you, how do you become a good hymn writer? I think, as you well said, uh, um, the Psalms would be, a, would be a beautiful place to start because they're rich in theology, but they're also rich in anthropology. What I mean by that is, is um, you think of a given emotion, for example, that human beings have, uh, it, it's hard to not see it in, in the Psalms. Uh, you think of, of an affection or affliction that people go through, it's hard to not see it in the Psalms. And, and um, the good hymns then, uh, they, they attach the heart and soul of, of the meaning of God's word uh, to the, the intellect, will, and emotion, as you well said. How do, you, how do you arrive at that? Well, it requires two things, a study of God's word and then also a study of music. Um, and that takes a lot. Uh, um, you know, Professor Tiefel used to say, it takes 10 years to get a good pianist it takes another ten, uh, eight years on top of that to get a good organist. And, you know, and that's why, like, just sort of slopping something together for an organ setting, um, you can do a whole lot of harm if you don't know what you're doing. And the same thing is true when it comes to music. Uh, I was a music major for a year. Um, I took a, a, um, music theory, and we learned box rules of order, all of those sorts of things. And I learned enough um, that at the end of that year, I, 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 um, I, I left the school and, and studied to be a pastor. I knew enough to know that I was, I was kind of over my head. I, um, I don't want to um, say that it's just for pastors 
or it's just for people who have been playing the organ for 40 years. I don't want to say that, but I do want to set, set a bar to be able to say you have to understand music very well and you have to understand theology very well. And when both of those come together, then you could be a, a, a hymn writer. I know we're coming close on time, but I, I found a connection between you know maybe becoming a, a good cook and becoming a good hymn writer. It's funny that um, you know the amount of years you have to learn just to chop an onion correctly and chop a carrot correctly mm -hmm. and you know know what every where everything is in the kitchen and you start working in salads you actually start bussing and then you start dishwashing and then you start but you know expediting and then you work your way up the line you know in the different forms of chef until you finally get to that um and each step of the way you're learning something and i, I think like for instance i i've you know, I'm, I don't consider myself a poet, but I, you know, I've written a hymn on occasion here and there. But I don't think I even began to even attempt writing a hymn until I was maybe in my mid thirties, where I felt comfortable uh, doing it at that point because I'd sung enough, I'd studied enough, I felt right. I kind of understood how to uh, put it together enough. But I, I think one of the things too is that this is not something necessarily that we expect every young kid to do. We right. may have older right. people in the congregation who have the ability to do that too. You may have people who have a gift, but to encourage them. Um, one pastor in our uh, uh, fellowship, um, I was pastor in the pun for many years, um, but uh, he always had a hymn writing contest um, in his church, and uh, and he it was open to everybody. And I thought it was, he really, and a lot of really beautiful hymns were produced um, and shared. I still use some of them. But it's amazing how when you give people the chance even to excite them, it, it, it really goes on. I just have one more point, and then I think we're, we're coming to an end, but um, Pastor Schmidt, thinking about um, this wealth of bringing out old with new, of encouraging, and so on, um, what is the one thing we say, what is your one piece of advice to somebody who just feels we just have to kind of clear the decks if, if we want to reach the next generation? How, how would you You'd say the decks are too, you know, this is a really valuable thing we want to pass on. How do we give to our congregations? How do we give to our organists the confidence of not only the wealth that we have, but that this isn't set in stone, but it is something that primes the pump for our worship going forward into the next generation? I guess one of the things that I've tried to do. Is there are plenty of kids usually in the congregation that, that take piano lessons. So obviously they can't necessarily play at the high level that we would sing to, but they can play pre-service and post-service, and they definitely yeah, can yeah, play yeah. for the, the, the offering. Um, and then, assuming that on the eighth day the organ didn't fall from heaven, there are other, I know now I'm going to be ostracized. Ninth day? Ninth day, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, but there are kids that, and again, and I think there needs to be part of the issue that I think some of us have with, with some music is, is, is reverence. But I think the acoustic guitar is very reverent. Horns are very reverent. All of these things. Yeah. My encouragement to any of us is by the time they enter confirmation, if we haven't, Find those little places because if you can get them at that age, yep. chances are they aren't going to have this attitude. I have to either come up with something new or let's just throw everything else out before. They'll be able to, to grow into it and appreciate it. And the more people we have appreciating it, even though it's not perfect, but the more they'll, they'll see value in it and they'll be able to continue on with their own age group. It, it, the pastor says this is good. Well, your pastor, you have to tell us this. But if my peer says this is a good thing, I might listen to you a little bit more, you know, in this area, or at least give it a, 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 a second look. And so that would be my one encouragement. Um, nothing crazy, just a little place like there, and it just keeps them wanting to come back. Hopefully, it's a reminder too that that church isn't just for big people. Well, and, and again, I think that just to close this closing thought before we close the prayer days, I, I think that. It's not hard to show the wealth of our congregation, but let us not treat the wealth with, with a, a rabbinic rigidity that we, these are the right. only right. hymns right. that we can right. ever sing, yep. um, that we encourage young, but also that let all the people participate and let's find a place for this. In other words, the liturgy, hymnody is big, it's a huge tent. It's not this narrow little tiny pup tent we gotta cram five hymns into. Right. It's a gigantic thing that we can 
we can rearrange and, and grow into for the, till the Lord comes in glory and we would still never exhaust the end of it. That brings us to the end of our, our time today. Thank you for our discussion. As always, it's riveting, um, but uh, I'm going to ask Pastor Schmidt to close the prayer today. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this time together to grow in our faith. Uh, may we take away from this the fact that you communicate to us through those hymns that we sing on Sunday mornings or whenever we worship. And may we truly appreciate uh, that blessing, both as we worship here, but then as we go home and try to make it an active part of our daily life. We ask for your help in this area through Jesus, your son. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We will see you for our final session next time where we're going to talk about choices. Choices we make choices. in the series. All right.